Well, let's talk to Jeremy. He's with us uh, in Jerusalem tonight. Uh, Jeremy, good to see you. The deadline, I think, is on the two hours away now. One of the hospitals has been told to evacuate immediately. There are 300,000 reservists who've been mobilised. The army on the border in the crouch position ready to go. When do you think the order will come? Well, I don't think it's going to come in two hours from now. Uh, there was a briefing, uh, on the record briefing, given this morning by the Israeli army. And in that they said, yes, we accept it might take longer than 24 hours. They didn't say how much extra time they might be building in. Uh, you know, I'm not sure the Israelis themselves are entirely ready in terms of the build-up that they want. Armies have a lot to do to get all their forces in a row for putting on what is a very complex operation. I think there's an, there is intelligence stuff they need to sort out as well. They want to go after the leaders who are in Gaza of Hamas. So I think they would very much like perhaps to start their operation with some kind of enormous strike that kills, uh, I don't know, some secret command bunker or something like that. But I have no idea if they have managed to obtain that kind of information. But if you look at everything that's happening, Christian, the, uh, these instructions, I mean, it's, you know, it's called advice. It's an instruction. Move south or else to civilians. The state of siege that's been put in, which uh, they've even cut off the water. And uh, the, 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 all the military activity that's going on, they're preparing the battlefield. They are going to do an offensive. I think there's no doubt about it. Is the intention, Jeremy, to make this as miserable and as punishing for the Palestinian people that in some way they separate them from Hamas? Do you think that is the strategy of the Israeli government? I think putting pressure on Palestinians, yes, is definitely one way to try and put pressure on Hamas. But the thing is, an awful lot of Palestinians aren't behind Hamas anyway. Uh, Hamas, all the Palestinian leaders from Fatah to Hamas, the two main factions. Fatah control the West Bank, which is the area that more or less runs from Jerusalem to, well, parts of the West Bank, I should say. They govern, uh, but not in a very effective way, parts of the West Bank, part of that part of the occupied territories. Uh, and Hamas are in Gaza. And to be honest, neither is beloved. Uh, both has, have followers, some very faithful followers, but I think most Palestinians over quite a few years now have become deeply cynical and depressed about their political prospects, their prospects for independence, which is what people, a lot of them, dreamt about, their prospects, in other words, for freedom. And I think there is a sense in which extremists have been able to function, uh, sorry, have been able to thrive in that kind of desperate atmosphere. There's been no peace process for an awfully long time. I mean, none whatever. There was an attempt 10 years ago by the Americans under the Obama administration, a couple of presidents ago, to try and get the whole thing going again, but it failed. Uh, the question, of course, that everyone will ask tomorrow is how many of the million people have gone? And I was asked that on a World Service programme today. And I was recounting a story, Jeremy, from back in 2008. I was interviewing a woman in Gaza City who was sitting on a suitcase. And during this interview, she started rootling in the, her suitcase and she pulled out a key. And this key was to the front door of the house that they lost in 1948 when they were expelled from their ancestral land. And she said to me, this is the second time I've lost my home to the Israelis. And I think that will be in the minds of some of these people, won't it, in, in northern Gaza. They, are, they might not be of Hamas, but they are part of the resistance and they will see the echoes in history. The, uh, what they know as the Nakba, the catastrophe, is you know, the great trauma in Palestinian history. It was when the Palestinian society that existed in this land was splintered and dispersed. Uh, the area, for example, that area uh, around Gaza with the Israeli farms, kibbutzes, towns, uh, big fields, rather fertile, there were, Palis there were Palestinian villages there, uh, there were um, Palestinian farms, there, the town of Ashkelon, which is 
very much an Israeli town, had a different name, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, and so, yes, I think when people hear, Palestinians hear, the Israelis saying, you've got to get out, all those ghosts come up again. They start to rise up out of history. Frankly, history is never very far away here. People are very conscious of what happened, not just in the immediate past, but back in their grandparents' time. And, uh, and add to that, because of the extreme nature of the people who, until he formed his war cabinet, were sustaining the government um, and taking part in very prominent positions in the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, there were people there who were talking about a second Nakba. And the concept of transfer is something that has been discussed, i.e. expelling Palestinians, mm. has, is something which has been widely discussed in Zionist thought almost from the outset. So, uh, you know, there's when just one small thing, bingo, all of this history going back a century or more in some cases comes pouring out. And that's why in the piece that... that that you've just played that I did, there was that man in Gaza saying, it happened to my grandfather, now it's happening to us. Yeah. Um, the, there was one other thing that happened today which made me think of you. You'll have heard the very sad story that a, a Reuters cameraman uh, has been killed on the, the northern border. Uh, we're seeing him uh, here in the picture. Um, our mm. sympathies to the Reuters team who were uh, there on the border and, and, and uh, have suffered that. Um, but it, it brought back memories, of course, Jeremy, of, of what you suffered 20 years ago in a, in a very similar position, uh, and it must have come back to you as well. Mm. Yes, 20 years ago, well, 2000, more than that, is when the Israelis were pulling out of South Lebanon. Uh, I was working with uh, a Lebanese cameraman and a Lebanese fixer driver called Abed Takush, and, uh, you know, the Israelis opened fire from across the border uh, and killed him. Uh, and then they had a go at killing uh, Malik, the cameraman, and myself with the heavy machine gun. They didn't succeed, but uh, Abed was killed. Uh, yes, uh, you know, journalism, especially in war zones, can be a very dangerous job. And sometimes journalists are targeted, and sometimes they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's yeah, what can I say? I'm full of sympathy for that family because, uh, I mean, I, I will never forget the funeral of Abed and uh, going back to Beirut the day after he was killed and going up and to explain to his wife exactly how he died. Um, that was a pretty bad day. Yeah. It's a reminder how much we depend on these first eyewitness accounts from reporters in times like this, but it is a very dangerous job um, and we're grateful to all of them. So, Jeremy Bowen, thank you very much for coming on the programme. Thank you. Uh, let's speak to Dr. Salam Vakil. She is the director of the Middle East and North Africa programme at Chatham House, think tank here in the UK. Thank you for being with us and thank you for your patience. I know you've been standing by for us. It's, uh, I was just thinking, listening to Jeremy there, it's extraordinary that this story in, in the Middle East wasn't really in the headlines just a week ago. The National Security Advisor at the White House was telling us that the Middle East was taking less and less of his time. And a week on, we're on the brink of what? We're on the brink of disaster. That's where we are. And uh, this speaks of the hubris um, of uh, Western governments, uh, the inattentiveness to a crisis that those of us that work on the Middle East and have been watching the Middle East knew um, has been simmering for so long. Um, and it's been left unattended. And, and this is where we are on the brink of a catastrophe that is going to uh, be passed down uh, to further generations. Uh, the the Israelis um, have the right and they've made the point that they need to respond to Hamas and uh, to decapitate the leadership of Hamas and they will do that. But it's an extraordinary order, isn't it, to, to, to evacuate a million people, to put, I mean, hospitals under such pressure to evacuate the, the wounded, the seriously wounded in, in just under two hours. It's an impossible request for, for the people of Gaza to, to meet. It is a catastrophe and it is um, 
impossible to imagine, as you've rightly described. Uh, this is putting uh, immense pressure on ordinary individuals who don't deserve this, who will bear the price for this. Um, it is a, a true injustice uh, that could have and should have uh, been thought through and handled uh, differently. Uh, you cannot mobilize uh, over a million people in 24 hours and transfer them. This is creating another crisis, a displacement of epic proportion, um, and it won't be forgotten. Um, it, ordinary people, people who don't support Hamas are paying the price, um, and this is collective punishment. Obviously, um we're looking at the the wider region, and we're particularly focusing on on Lebanon at this 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 time. The Americans, the challenge, I suppose, for the Americans is to support the Israeli operation and their objectives without this escalating to the wider region, and that is a delicate balance to walk, isn't it? It certainly is, and that's why the Americans have uh, sent a sort of carrier into the East Med, and they're also doing so into the Persian Gulf. They need. Uh, to support Israel, a long-standing American ally, um, and uh, they want to sh to be there as a deterrent. Um, they don't want this to open up into a multi-front war. Nobody wants this to escalate. But at the same time, the U.S. is risking um, their reputation. Uh, they are supporting a human catastrophe, and, and this will have blowback. Um, sincerely, Hamas um, is a terrorist group, and, and there is uh, a clear need uh, to push back and, and to be deliberate, um, at, but at the same time, passing um, the baton on to individuals and, and pursuing this conflict or, or like engaging mm. in, in such a violent way on um, the population um, is going to perpetuate the conflict. Uh, and that in itself um, is dangerous. Yeah, we'll maybe talk about the objectives and where this goes towards the end of the conflict a little later in the programme. Uh, Dr. Vakil, thank you very much indeed for that.